I'm a managing director at the World Economic Forum, and my great pleasure to have with us um, a very illustrious panel who can tell us more about what that future outlook is for the world of work. Uh, to my immediate left, um, Martin Walsh, the U.S. Secretary of Labor, welcome. Uh, to his left, uh, Gilbert Hongbo, Director General of the International Labor Organization. Uh, and to his left, Julie Sweet, CEO of Accenture. And finally, at the far end of the panel, Dan Schulman, President and CEO of PayPal. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we're excited that today it marks exactly the third year anniversary of the Reskilling Revolution initiative um, launched here in Davos in January 2020. Um, with the goal to reach one billion people with better education, better skills, better learning, and better jobs by 2030. Three years into the initiative, um, today we're announcing that 350 million people have been reached, so just about over the, the point that we should be at, 30% uh, of the way into the timeline. Uh, through the work of multiple governments, through the work of multiple businesses, and most importantly, through the work of several public-private collaborations in this space. We also launched earlier this week a report on the future of jobs. And of course, um, that's the topic for today. While there's plenty to worry about in terms of future disruptions, there's also a huge amount of opportunity. For example, one of the studies that came out um, says that there are 76 million jobs in social and green sectors alone in just 10 of the economies that were covered as part of this data. So plenty of opportunity, and at the same time, plenty to also worry about in terms of technological shifts, um, in terms of shifting supply chains, and in terms of the disruptions from the green transition. And that's some of what we will be discussing today. For the first set of comments, um, Secretary Walsh, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, and it's uh, thank you all. Uh, it's great to be on this panel, and thank you for being here with us today, and folks that are watching uh, from home and offices, welcome. Uh, it's it's my first uh, this is my first uh, World Economic Forum visit, uh, and I've had a, a great day talking to people uh, and sharing the, the vision of the Biden Harris administration, particularly around a worker centered economy. Uh, President Biden is, is focused on building an economy that works from the bottom up and the middle out. That means creating good jobs and creating pathways into the middle class. Uh, this approach is getting results. If you if you unemployment is at a 50 year low, uh, and we want to build in you know, in the United States, I should say, and we want to build on that success. So. Uh, I was eager to come here and, and learn from companies from, uh, and countries and other folks that are here today. Uh, just to kind of um, sum up my job a little bit, uh, the first session we had was reskilling, uh, the Reskilling Revolution Initiative, and, and it quite honestly falls in line with, with uh, what we're doing in the United States and what we need to do coming out of a global pandemic. I think that we have a unique opportunity uh, with the pandemic, uh, with, with coming back and how do you build back, build back stronger, uh, an economy that works for everyone. And part of that is reskilling and, and upskilling people. Uh, and we're doubling down in the United States on that. We spent $380 million last year alone on apprenticeships. Uh, we're spending money on job training, workforce development. And in the legislation that's been passed um, in the legislature this year, uh, there's job training opportunities in all of that, that, that work including construction and, and, and manufacturing after the fact. Uh, I also joined a, 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 a session about a talent uh, track, a, attracting talent and, and how do we do this for, for workers that have been underrepresented for a long time uh, are essential for growing our workforce and really focusing on communities of color, women uh, in America, rural America, uh, veterans, and in other parts of the globe and having these conversations today. Uh, and on my first panel, we had uh, India represented there, Italy represented there, and really talk in, in the European Union represented there. And the challenges are a little different, but at the end of the day, the themes are all the same. How do, how do we continue to move forward? And tomorrow, I'm going to talk about good jobs, the good jobs initiative, highlighting uh, the historic clean energy investments uh, that the president is, is launching um, in the United States and, and how do we work around the globe with that? How do we continue to move forward and making sure that these are good jobs? So uh, I could go more into it. Uh, I'll stop there and I'll turn it back to you and, and then we can go, I can go back into some of the stuff if there's more pointed questions. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Gilbert, your perspective globally, um, how are some of these trends playing out and what do you think the greatest needs are? 
Um, thank you so much and welcome um, you all um, uh, as well. I mean, globally, a uh, few days ago, um, we, uh, ILO, we have launched our, the, the, the World Economic and Social Outlook, outlook uh, WESO, we call it, uh, um, report, and uh, also a few weeks uh, back, our annual wage, uh, wage report. And I'm, as, I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid that the news are not necessarily uh, what we will want to uh, we want to hear. Um, the global at the global level, um, the, uh, the, the the employment growth um, is slowing down, and we, we project uh, only one percent uh, uh, employment growth uh, um, in 20 in 2023. 20, uh, at the same time, um, we also expect uh, productivity <laughs> to go down uh, in 2020 and 2023 at the, at, at the, at the, global, uh, at the global level. Um, you would not also be surprised that the, the, the current uh, um, 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 multiple crises, uh, uh, including the war in, in, in Ukraine and uh, other crises uh, uh, um, leading to the inflation, inflationary situation, uh, is putting a lot of pressure on, on the, the real wage, um, particularly for the, um, the, the low-skilled um, workers that are really um, um, at risk of uh, losing part of their um, purchasing um, power. Um, another dimension that is quite very um, of concern to um, ILO is the quality of job. Um, one thing is to talk about the job creation in terms of quantity, but the quality of job is really, and um, what we have noticed, uh, if globally, um, particularly in the global north, the, there is a recovery in terms of number of hours worked compared to the last quarter in 2019, i.e. Um, um, pre-COVID, um, uh, we know that in the, in the rest um, of the world, um, the initial recovery earlier in, in the year 2022 has been wiped off um, in, the, in the third and fourth, quarter, uh, fourth quarter. So then the, the, the new uh, our work that been created, the new job that be created, are much more in the informal uh, informal sector. Uh, so that uh, um, for us is uh, we know what uh, the informal sector, what it imply in terms of uh, uh, um, lack of a minimum um, social um, protection or, or, or protection uh, um, schemes. Uh, obviously, we also uh, um, some of you may have uh, looked at our report. We have started developing um, a new um, um, index to really highlight what uh, Secretary Walsh talked about it this morning at the session um, a, a, in, in terms of the, what we call the job gaps, not just about the unemployment, i.e. taking into account uh, um, um, workers that have just that, are, that have decided to quit um, the, the job market uh, um, per se, or um, um, we, we, if you look at the, the unpaid care economy, for example, where we know 75% are women, and that couldn't really free themselves up to go back to the job market, all of that is uh, um, a major concern uh, um, 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 for us. The last point that I will just uh, make is um, to highlight that uh, if you look at the, the youth bulge, um, um, which remain, if you look at the youth that are uh, neither in employment nor in education or training, the need, as we call them, and they remain at 23% uh, uh, um, um, for, um, for 2023. Uh, so it's quite, uh, and those are a little bit the situation. Thank you very much. Very, very helpful to have that global outlook. Um, Julie, on the spectrum of uh, techno-optimism or techno-pessimism around jobs, your views? I think we're actually living in one of the best moments in history to actually be able to create systems that allow the lower skilled um, to have good jobs and to allow countries to be able to, um, to, to flip when they need to. And that's because uh, the disruption we've gone through and the technology advancements have meant that to thrive in the next decade, companies and countries have to be able to access talent, they have to be able to be talent creators, and they've got to be able to unlock that talent, which often means you know, um, being a more diverse place to be able to you know, really unlock diverse talent. 
And it's that central piece that you have to be able to create talent. There are not enough skills in the world that we need. And that's why when you think about the US spending $380 million on apprenticeships, that is driven by the need to create talent where we have gaps. At Accenture in the US, we have 2,000 apprentices in professional services, unheard of. We started with five in 2015. Uh, and the key to being able to reset skill at scale starts with technology. When um, the uh, pandemic hit and there was this massive need for cloud skills, we retrained 100,000 people at Accenture in six months. We were able to do that because our people, we have a complete inventory of their skills. We could run AI algorithms against those skills and identify who could be reskilled. Now, when you think about the challenges that we just heard from Gilbert and the secretary around the need for upskilling, right? technology is going to be part of how we'll be able to identify what are the gaps, who could be reskilled, what are adjacent skills. Then you think about how you do that reskilling. So we have over 750,000 people at Accenture. I require, as the CEO, with my entire C-suite, all of those individuals to take 11 assessments across technology. We call it TQ. So, at, at, you know, last year, about 680,000 had passed eight assessments. That I can do all around the globe because I use a technology platform. I'm able to then uh, provide assessments and put automatically, without lots of people, these individuals on which learning path they need in order to pass the assessment. And so this uh, convergence of need with actual technology that will allow upskilling at scale and then good government, I think makes me extraordinarily optimistic. Thank you, Julie. Financial inclusion is obviously a huge part of the future of jobs. Dan, your views? Yeah, I think financial inclusion or financial uh, health um, is something that we need to be thinking about, not just access to jobs or skills, um, because the single biggest competitive advantage that any company has is the strength of their workforce. Are they passionate about what they're doing? Are they dedicated to the company? And do they have a semblance of physical uh, health, mental health, as well as financial health. And um, one of the things that we talk about all the time is how many people struggle to get by at the end of every month. And in the U.S., which is one of the world's most developed countries, almost two out of every three adults struggle to get by. They struggle in between paychecks uh, to pay their bills. And I did a survey of PayPal employees because honestly I thought we're a tech company, we pay at or above market rates. Our survey would come back and would reveal that we were paying extremely well, our workers were very happy and I was gonna talk about that at an all employee meeting. What I found is that for our entry level employees and all of our call center employees, that they were financially stressed as well. Two thirds of them also struggled to make ends meet. And it was a big aha moment where I realized that for many segments of the population, the market is not working for them. Uh, even though you're paying at market wages, people are financially stressed. And we did a measure of this. We basically surveyed how much net disposable income do our employees have after they pay their taxes and essential living expenses. And what we found is for that population, all they had was between four to 6% net disposable income. So they were obviously ill-prepared for any emergency. They couldn't afford any unexpected expense. They were picking and choosing. Do they put uh, food on the table or take health care benefits? And what we decided is that the single biggest investment we could do to maximize return for PayPal would be to invest our employees. And so we raised wages. We uh, made every employee in PayPal an owner of the company. 
so everybody gets restricted stock and has a stake in the success of the company. And then we lowered the cost of healthcare benefits by over 65%. And then we wrapped all of that into a financial education program. This is the first time that our employees had had equity, that they actually had savings. And what we found by doing that is now the NDI in the U.S., net disposable income in the U.S., is 15%, up from 4 to 6%. And internationally, we've reached 34%, uh, from 4 to 6%. And what that's led to is less turnover. Our attrition is at lows. Our engagement scores with our employees are at all-time high. Our net promoter scores in terms of satisfying customers are at all-time high. Our training costs are actually lower because we have less attrition. And I feel that as CEOs, we need to at least measure how healthy our employees, because if they're financially stressed, then we are sub-optimizing how successful we can be uh, as companies. And I think um, we can't look to just the public sector for that. We need to work with the public sector, but we have the obligation and I think moral obligation to take care of our own employees. Thank you. Other views on that? Well, I would just say that, you know, and I think um, it's both the right thing to do and it's good business. So we've done work around, uh, you know, this topic around, we call it being net better off. If, you, if your employees are net better off for working there, the impact on your profitability is significant. Yeah. And one of the characteristics of being net better off is financial security. Not paying market. That's different. Yep. It's actual financial security. And so, again, why I am optimistic is that when these things don't make business sense, they're very hard to be sustained. They become tied to CEOs, uh, to moments in time. And in fact, if you factor in financial security as part of your employee framework, it will help drive profit. Can I just, ju I just want to jump in there real quick? You, you know, um, do you want to speak? No, please. Right. Um, you know, <clears throat> hearing Dan and Julie both talk about private sector, um, one of the things that, that we're focused on at the Department of Labor, when we talk about job training, workforce development, and apprenticeship, it's not a program made by us, and we then tell the companies how to do it. It's about listening to the companies and what the needs are of the companies. And I really think that at this moment in time, uh, whether it's a reskilling re revolution or whatever it might be, it really is about working collectively with business to understand what business needs and how do we make those investments, whether it's in job training through states and cities, whether it's directly with companies, with apprenticeships. Uh, we've done more in apprenticeships. Well, I shouldn't say this. We've done a lot in apprenticeships. I don't know if we've done more than in the past, but we've done a lot in apprenticeships. We've identified areas like cybersecurity and trucking and nursing. Nursing, we're looking at teaching, and I, I do think we have an opportunity right now. And I think that billion number that you talked about this morning, three years ago, when you said it's not that far off. And I think we have a lot of industries that are, you know, when you think about when you think about the workforce in America right now, the unemployment rate is three point five percent, the participation rate sixty two percent, not as high as we'd like it to be. Unemployment in the black community is five point seven percent. There are plenty of workers in America that are under under working underworked right now, underpaid, if you will, or in the wrong industry. And there are people sit, hanging in communities right now across America that would never think of being able to work for a tech company. Meanwhile, tech companies are looking for them to come in. They don't need the college degree. And if you put the right training programs like the Building Trace have out there, and, and it's sustainable with while well, work while you get paid while you work, we really can make a difference. It really can. And if you have employers that are treating their employees correctly and training them, then they they, 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 they're gonna they're gonna stay keep the, they're gonna keep those folks with the company. So I think there's a win-win here, and we had a lot of discussions today about it. And we can do it, and, and I think we can do it quickly. And I think that that's something that I think is really important. I just wanted to to compliment. I believe this is quite a very rich uh, um, um, discussion, and and I really appreciate what the uh, the CEO of uh, PayPal and Julie were uh, saying the critical nature of um, having. Um, uh, workers, employees that are not um, financially uh, um, stressed. And one point that uh, ILO has been kind of pushing in this uh, um, discussion is it's very difficult to just um, imagine, um, I was saying in my previous session, 214 million today of workers in the, around the globe 
that are really considered as poor, meaning that they work the normal week, 40 hours a week, yet they are not able to even pay the bills at the end of, at the, end of the, 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 the month. So sooner or later, it's going to be important for us to bring back to, 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 to life, to the discussion, the real notion of an adequate um, wage, um, for an adequate living wage, um, to ensure that at the end of the day, there is a decency uh, of what every worker um, could live, uh, could live um, with and link with uh, uh, um, that with the opportunities that uh, uh, Secretary uh, Walsh was, uh, uh, was um, referring, uh, referring to. The um, second point uh, um, for, 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 for me is you have to look at that also when we look at that at the national level, maybe sometimes it's simpler. When you look at that at the international level, the, then you really have to look at the, the, the global supply chain. And how do we or could we um, ensure those principles that we are talking about are also spread across the global um, supply, um, supply chains? That is another challenge that um, we have right now. At the same time, where the global supply chain are also a silver lining for, for, for wealth and job creation on that. Thank you. Very helpful. And, and in fact, part of the discussions that have happened over the, the course of the, the, the day have been about you know, the future of globalization not really being based around wage arbitrage and uh, competing on the basis of cheap labor, but really about skilled labor, skilled talent, living wages, um, and, then, and then being able to compete in that global economy. I do want to open it up to questions. We have a few minutes for questions. Please say your name and your organization and directly move on to your question. Um, hi, Faisal Islam, BBC News. A uh, question for Mr Hungbo and one for Mr Walsh. Um, the uh, UK government has introduced minimum service level legislation against unions um, that they could, uh, workers could be fired or unions could be sued if minimum service levels are not agreed in key public services. They have cited the ILO as supporting these agreements. What's your reaction? Should we start with that? The uh, UK is one of our, uh, obviously, our founding um, member, and uh, um, we are working very, very um, closely with uh, all our uh, member states, including United Kingdom. Um, but uh, I'm not uh, aware of any um, bilateral discussion on this matter. Um, what um, um, for us is quite very um, critical, not only in the UK, but uh, across the world. You know, in a situation of uh, economic downturn, um, we are very worried that workers may have to accept um, situation be, um, so they don't get themselves out of job. Um, they may have to accept situation that is below par on, 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 on that. Um, fundamentally, our, our, our position, um, ILO does not have the, 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 the necessarily, is not trying to interfere in the national level discussion, but we really want to stress the importance of social dialogue uh, amongst the three parties to really um, have a, a sustainable um, um, way forward. Any other questions? Okay. Well, then I will um, I, I will ask a question. Uh, Julie, you had mentioned you know sort of the, being able to do some of this at scale, and Dan, you had also mentioned that. How do we take this beyond companies like PayPal and Accenture? What are the right kinds of incentives? And it's an open question to to all of you. Well, I'll start. Um, well, first of all, um, Julie and I actually together are working. To, um, to drive this idea of financial health across a wide range of CEOs. We have actually an initiative that we're working with uh, Just Capital to go and do that, to at least encourage CEOs to uh, get a sense or measure the degree of financial health um, that their workers are experiencing. And then every company can approach it individually from that because every company is different. I also think there is a immense opportunity um, as we come out of COVID and where we work and how we work is being redefined. 
Um, I mean, I think that opens up job markets that previously um, were difficult to access. If we're a Silicon Valley company, if everything is in Silicon Valley, it's hard to find jobs in West Virginia or around the world. Um, but now, we, since we, we're not working just at the office, we can open up that aperture. I think the other thing that people are often worried about are things like AI replacing people. You know, over the last 100 years, we've had one technology after another come about, always with, you know, forecasts of doom going on. You know, the advent of the telephone was going to be the, you know, the end of all manners because you could just call somebody without first writing them a note that you were coming over. Um, and I do think that things like AI may actually open up opportunity for people who have different skills to do things like basic coding, because AI will be able to do things like basic coding. It may need human interface to take a look at it, et cetera, but the skills will be different. And I do think that there's a big opportunity for us to think about where we work, how we work, and how we use AI to really open the aperture up and not be so afraid of it, but figure out how do we work with it. Um, I would start where Secretary Walsh was with respect to the importance of public and private uh, collaboration. Um, at the end of the day, jobs are local. A person lives someplace and they fill a need. And uh, when you bring together the public sector, both government and schools, as well as the not-for-profits, with the private sector, and you get alignment about basic principles, you can do amazing things. For example, skills are the new currency. We need to be aligned around that. The educational system needs to be aligned. Companies need to understand it, this idea of being talent creators and the, and the need to be able to do that. And once you begin to speak that same language, you can look at curriculum, you can look at gaps, you can have expectations of roles and that. And so really focusing and remembering that jobs are local and the collaboration and the needed collaboration, I think, is absolutely critical. And then bringing innovation. I mean, you know, much of what's happening in the US, for example, around apprenticeships, we learned from Europe and then we innovated in professional services, moving beyond a lot of the traditional places to say, how can we fill technology gaps? At Accenture, 48% of our jobs in the US do not require a four-year degree. And we're a tech company in professional services. So you know, that kind of innovation came from a lot of collaboration. How do you talk to schools? How do you really think about what they have? So uh, I, I do believe that the secret is making sure that we are doing the collaboration, speaking the same language, and then bringing innovation. Thank you. Did you want to come in with another yes, question? Just, Please. Sorry about that. Sorry, Faisal again, BBC News. Uh, for Secretary Walsh, just to try and get you on the record, really. Uh, there's been a you know, big speech by Ursula van der Leyen of the European Commission about a response from Europe to your government's Inflation Reduction Act and the perception that it's having an effect on jobs in Europe, tempting industries across to America. That's the point of it. Um, do you have a response on behalf of the administration to fears in Europe that this is a, an act of green protectionism? I don't, I don't have a technical response, uh, be, but certainly I've had some conversations today that I will be having more dialogue with the White House uh, before I go back. I'll be making a call to them. I actually put a call to them earlier today to talk about some of the concerns I heard today and the fears. But I know that you know the United States has a very good working relationship with, uh, I think, the two countries. Uh, well, one was Germany today. I heard a lot, a lot of concerns. There's a good relationship with Germany, uh, and certainly we want to keep a strong relationship with our allies. But you don't mean it to take jobs from your... No, that wasn't the intention, I don't believe, behind it. I think that, uh, you know, I think there's some senators here as well talking about it. And again, I, I want to don't want to get ahead of the White House, so I want to just, you know, make sure that, that the answer is um, what is accurate. I don't want to get too far ahead of that. But it has come up a couple times today. I thought you were going to ask me about the other question. Which one's that? The one you asked before. Oh, well, I'll, ask you, I'll ask you about that then. Um, does, does America back minimum service levels? No, I don't. Uh, no, I, again, I don't know enough about I don't know enough about the legislation, but I certainly will work with the ILO. Um, we're a member of the ILO as well, the United States. And I don't know the, what the legislation is, but I don't think, you know, I, I would not support anything that would um, take away from workers. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can quickly maybe add, uh, um, add to that, you know, ILO, we do also have our 
um, supervisory, independent uh, supervisory control mechanism on that. And the, 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 the United Kingdom uh, um, trade union, they know uh, this uh, machinery. They can also file. I'm not suggesting to do it, but they do have the possibility also to file for a complaint on, 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 on that. And for that, uh, yes, ILO has been also in discussion with the trade unions uh, on that matters. Yeah. Thank you very much. I do want to use the final minute um, that we have left for just a final few seconds from each of you on one challenge as everybody walks away from, from this conversation, one challenge we need to overcome and one major opportunity around the future of jobs. Dan, would you like to start? Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is it? One challenge and one, one challenge, opportunity. One opportunity. I think they may uh, be two sides of, uh, of the same sword. Um, I think the challenge is that um, technology is moving so rapidly uh, right now. We are at the early stages of an AI revolution. We're at the early stages of connectivity at massive speeds and reduced latency, new forms of compute power through quantum um, that will fundamentally change everything. And I think keeping up with that is very difficult, both on the private and the public sector. At the same time, it offers tremendous opportunity to do things faster, more efficiently, redefine a lot of the status quo that I think can open up tremendous opportunity for the world. Thank you. Julie? Uh, technology has the power to reskill millions of people, which is what we need. Uh, the challenge is that whatever we do has to be sustainable, so it has to work from an economic perspective. And that needs to have real discussion so that we make sure that we are having sustainable solutions that are the right thing to do and that we can afford. Thank you. Shubhir? Yeah, I, I, I will agree with uh, both Dan and Julie that the technology, the, for me, the digital economy is one of the really the prospect for all of us. And I also agree with Dan by saying that it's two sides of the same coin. The, the, the challenge is to make sure that how do we capitalize on the uh, digital economy at the same token, making sure that we have um, a, a minimum protection um, for, for workers in the, in, the, in the domain. But globally, uh, both the silver lining and the challenge is how do we ensure that both the economy, the environment, and the social, they are three equal fit in moving forward for the world. We need a new social contract for that. Thank you. Final comment. Yeah, I, I'm going to bring it back to workforce development job training. I think that we need to make sure companies have the workers they need, and I think we need to make sure we strengthen the infrastructure particularly in the United States, around how do we make sure that, that we are creating opportunities and reaching into communities that haven't had opportunities in the past. Just simply saying it and laying out initiative is great, makes you feel good for five minutes in a press release, but it's how do you make sure that that is actually happening uh, and making sure that we use data to back up the information and continue those conversations. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Gilbert. And thank you, Secretary Walsh. Thank you to our in-person audience and to our live stream audience. Have a good evening.